This is Max Kammerman presenting for the Fundamentals of Sports Medicine on Knee Anatomy. Please follow us on social media. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and email us at fundamentalsofsm at gmail.com. As a disclaimer, please remember that these videos are meant to provide an educational resource for people who are interested in furthering their knowledge on anatomy and sports medicine, but should not replace or take the place of a physician's independent judgment. What I've done for this lecture is divided up the lecture into the couple typical views that you're going to be seeing a knee as it's presented either through x-ray or through MRI. And in sticking with this format of looking at anteroposterior, sagittal, and axial views of knee anatomy, the hope is that you will better be able to translate this conceptual knowledge into real-world imaging knowledge over x-ray and MRI. Now, beginning with the anterior view of the knee, we're going to cover the general structures that comprise the knee joint. And we'll begin with the bony anatomy. Of course, just to orient ourselves, we'll see that this is the superior aspect, inferior, lateral, and medial. We know that this is the lateral aspect of the knee due to the presence of the fibula. Otherwise, a couple of things to point out early on are the articular cartilage, which everybody should see here as highlighted in blue, over the lateral and medial femoral condyles. This articular cartilage is the cartilage which is affixed to the femur itself and which allows for smooth motion as the lateral and medial femoral condyles articulate over the lateral and medial menisci. The next slide will also show a more clear picture of the menisci such that we can see the articulation points. One more note is that the patella has been removed from this image, but would otherwise be sitting in this region here between the femoral condyles. And this is also why the femur continues to have articular cartilage underneath the surface of where the patella otherwise would be. Other things to look at now from this after identifying the bony and articular cartilage anatomy is the ligamentous anatomy of the knee. This image is a good image in terms of seeing the four main stabilizing ligaments of the knee, and these are also going to be the most likely sources of pathology for ligamentous injury of the knee. The couple of ones to point out, starting on the lateral aspect of the knee, is this structure here, which is the lateral collateral ligament, allowing for or preventing varus movement of the knee or bowing outward of the knee. And similarly, on the inside or medial aspect of the knee, we see the MCL, the medial collateral ligament. And what I would ask people to note here is how much broader the medial collateral ligament is than the lateral collateral ligament. This ligament extends far more inferiorly than the lateral collateral ligament as well, and extends actually beyond the tibial tuberosity here. Both of these originate on the lateral and medial aspect of the femur, respectively. Moving to the interior portion of the knee, we see the ACL projected toward the viewer, or toward us, and we see the PCL behind that. The ACL is important for stability of the knee, and its primary function is going to be to prevent anterior translation of the tibia, which is to say, preventing the tibia from sliding forward in relation to the femur, which it is articulating against. In allowing it to do that, the ACL originates on the inner surface of the lateral femoral condyle on the posterior aspect and travels anteriorly to its insertion point on the anterior tibial plateau, such that when the tibia is attempted to be translated anteriorly, such as in a Lachman or an anterior drawer test, the ACL is pulled taut. The PCL behind this is the reverse of this, where the origin is more toward the anterior aspect of the medial femoral condyle, and then inserts in the posterior aspect of the tibial plateau. 
The last things to cover for ligamentous or cartilaginous aspects of the knee joint are, of course, the menisci. You have the lateral meniscus, which ex will extend posteriorly and which, again, we'll see more clearly in the next image, and the medial meniscus. The medial meniscus is a much more robust structure than the lateral meniscus, and this is illustrated here by how thick this is versus the relatively thinner lateral meniscus here. Finally, we can see the distal portion of the patellar tendon as it inserts into the tibial tuberosity. This otherwise would extend superiorly into the base or the inferior pole of the patella, which would then uh, continue onward superiorly through the quadriceps tendon. As a note before we continue, this is not an exhaustive anatomical review. There are other structures which can be of clinical importance. However, these are the most likely or common areas to see pathology. Before we move on, I'll point out one last thing. The, this cut tendon here is likely the cut biceps femoris or biceps femoris, which inserts onto the fibular head. It's a common misnomer that the iliotibial band inserts here. The iliotibial band actually inserts into Gertie's tubercle on the tibia, more found here. Moving on, we'll look at, at, at an axial view of the knee. Just to orient ourselves one more time, we're looking from a superior vantage point down onto the plateau of the tibia. And when actually viewed in vivo, the tibial plateau is very much a plateau. It is a flat surface against which the femoral condyles articulate. To orient ourselves one more time for this, we have the anterior aspect of the knee here as well as the lateral and medial aspects. And we can tell that the lateral aspect is the lateral aspect, besides that it's labeled the lateral collateral ligament, because we know that the lateral collateral ligament is a smaller structure as compared to the medial collateral ligament. Similarly, the medial meniscus, as seen here by the semilunar disc structure, is much thicker than the lateral meniscus as seen here. And this makes sense physiologically because the majority of weight bearing that occurs in human beings is through the medial aspect of the knee. It's why a tibial fracture is often non-weight bearing while a lateral fibular fracture can often be weight borne. Continuing, I'd like to discuss now the differences between the menisci here. Beginning with the lateral meniscus, we can see still that it has this semilunar structure. And what I'd like to point out is the relative similarity in size between the anterior horn and the posterior horn. This will be seen more clearly on MRI imaging in one of our next lectures, but it's important to keep in mind when trying to orient oneself as you look through images of the knee, that when you're looking at the lateral aspect of the knee, that the horns of the meniscus should appear approximately the same size. And as we think about sagittal slices coming through the knee here, as we might see in MRI, this is going to appear as two triangular structures on the sagittal cut here and here, which we'll get a better sense of in the next image. Now, this is in contrast to the medial meniscus, which has a one-third, two-thirds rule in terms of the relative sizes of the anterior horn and posterior horn. This is to say that the posterior horn is going to be approximately twice as big as the anterior horn, or two-thirds of the relative size of the horns of the meniscus. In general, you're going to see most of your pathology in the posterior aspect of the meniscus, and when feeling on physical exam, the posterior aspect of the meniscus is the area where pathology is most likely to be found and elicited by pain. Moving on from this, this image provides a better illustration for the ACL as it relates to its function. Beginning with the ACL again, we can see its insertion into the anterior aspect of the tibial plateau. And although it's cut here, we can imagine that this is extending posteriorly and superiorly 
to the lateral femoral condyle. In contrast, the PCL is inserting here on the posterior aspect of the tibial plateau and would otherwise continue anteriorly and superiorly to the medial femoral condyle. Last, before we move on, we can see the area in the medial aspect of the tibial plateau and lateral aspect of the tibial plateau, which are part of the areas where the femoral condyles will articulate against the tibia. It's not well illustrated here, but this whole region will be the area of articulation for the medial femoral condyle, and this will be the area of articulation for the lateral femoral condyle. Moving on, we're going to be looking at a sagittal cut through the knee. I'll warn you guys that this image is not exactly anatomically correct, but we'll talk about the differences or talk about where it falls short as a true anatomical representation of the knee. And I've decided to use this image because I believe that it is a good illustration of certain other aspects or features of the joint, which I think are very important to know. Just to review what we understood from our last slide, let's begin with our look at the meniscus. We can see it here labeled as the lateral meniscus here with this triangle here, as well as here with this aspect here. To orient ourselves, we can see the patella here, so we know that this is the anterior aspect of the knee, and this is the posterior aspect of the knee. Now, as I said before, the lateral meniscus is going to have approximately equal sizes between the anterior and posterior horns of the meniscus. We understand that this is therefore going to be a slice through the meniscus at approximately this area, this region of the sagittal cut. However, when doing a sagittal cut at this point, we realize that the ACL and PCL will not be visible at all. And so the fact that we can see the ACL and PCL here is a good indication to us that we are not looking at an accurate view of the knee, that we are in fact viewing the knee potentially from the lateral side and viewing deeper into the knee than we would otherwise be able to on true imaging. Leaving that alone for a moment, this slide does a good job of illustrating the joint capsule and the contiguous nature that the joint has with itself with regards to fluid. Whenever there is intra-articular pathology or any swelling which occurs intra-articularly, the fluid will tend, to the move, will tend to move to the area of least resistance. The two areas that you're most likely to see swelling, therefore, in the knee, and whether this comes from infection, from autoimmune disease, from a rupture of an ACL or a meniscal tear, or even exacerbation of underlying osteoarthritis with wearing down of the articular cartilage, you're going to see swelling in two places. One is in the posterior aspect of the knee as the posterior capsule bows outward, and you'll be able to actually feel that or see that in the popliteal fossa. And the other area you're gonna be able to see that is in the suprapatellar pouch or uh, superior to the patella. And this will actually appear as swelling superior or proximal to the patella in the area of the quadriceps. Often, these areas will be sources of pain as the soft tissue is stretched. However, I would caution everybody in terms of diagnosing an injury in these areas as often the swelling and pain in these areas is secondary to an internal derangement. And it's important to ask about that in your history. Other things to note on this image are some of the other soft tissue structures that you might see in the knee, including the prepatellar bursa and the deep infrapatellar bursa. Both of these bursa are not contiguous with the joint and therefore swelling in these localized areas are more likely to be indicative of either trauma or direct pathology to these areas. And this is of course in contrast again to the suprapatellar bursa, which is contiguous with the joint space. Another structure to be aware of is the infrapatellar fat pad, as illustrated here by this orangish, yellowish looking stuff. This is also called Hoffa's fat pad and can at times become pinched in the knee and become inflamed. This is occasionally an area of pathology, though I encourage 
caution when diagnosing this as a source of pathology. In any event, this lecture is not meant to serve as an exhaustive demonstration or discussion of anatomy of the knee, but if you keep these several points in mind and understand the anatomy as I've discussed it, this will likely be sufficient to provide you with an excellent foundation for working through pathology of the knee in your clinics as a provider or in whatever capacity you have in the healthcare field. These slides were taken from several sources, including Pearson's Education Incorporated and we will link the references to them below the video on our page. Once again, follow us on social media. And if you have any questions, please type them in below or simply reach out to us or shoot us an email. Thanks for your time.